Thank you, everyone. We're going to get ready to start the next talk. I'd like to introduce our conference session chair, Professor Chang, who will be chairing the next two sessions. Take it away, Professor Chang. Thank you. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Joe Livingston. Um, Professor Livingston actually is uh, a fortieth in UK for um, Alzheimer's disease and psychiatric research. And he, uh, she is the professor of the um, older people in the division of the psychiatry at University of College London and consultant psychiatrist for the Camptons and uh, NHS FT in UK. Now, she leads a, uh, the Lancet Standing Committee on Dementia Prevention Intervention Care, published in uh, year 2027, 20, 2017, and year 2020. They contain life course analysis of potentially modifiable risk in dementia and recommendations for policy and individuals. She has worked with the colleagues to publish recent Lancet Health Aging studies show that individual interventions for hearing, hypertension, and smoking are cost effective and cost saving to prevent dementia. And she also works developing the testing intervention for people with dementia and their family. And that is continued the line of the risk factor and prevention. And let's welcome uh, Professor uh, Livingston for the pre-recorded lecture. Hello, um, my name is Jill Livingston and thank you for inviting me here today. I'm going to uh, talk to you today uh, about whether we can prevent dementia. Um, and I'm hoping that I am currently sharing, sharing my screen um, and that you'll be able to see my, uh, my slides. Um, so can we prevent dementia? I'm going to talk to you today about the Lancet Commission. And um, in the Lancet Commission, I'll show you, you can see in this front uh, page, we've done two so far, um, and uh, I've shown pictures of it. Um, and also uh, the references um, so that uh, if any of you want to, you can go and look at it. And I'll also show you my Twitter handle because I talk about this and other things on Twitter if you're interested. So the Lancet Commission is a work of many people, including uh, Carol Brain, who's going to talk to you today. Um, and uh, in particular, in the prevention work, um, Andrew Sambalad, Jonathan Huntley, Sergi Costa-Frieda and Nahid Makadam uh, did systematic reviews and a lot of the quite complicated maths so that we could come to conclusion. We were also uh, supported by University College London, the Alzheimer's Society, uh, the ESRC um, in Britain and Alzheimer's Research UK, who paid for uh, accommodation and flights, but uh, did not input into the findings. So I'm going to talk about why we should consider dementia preventable. And then I'm going to discuss individual risk factors, then um, discuss the concepts of population attributable fraction and commonality, and um, begin to think about different ethnic groups and uh, low and middle income countries and try and put that all together about what does it mean for us and what should we do. So as do you all here know, dementia, there are more people with dementia, as thankfully there are more older people uh, as fewer people are dying young. And the number of uh, people with dementia is expected to increase from around about 50 million to 132 million by 2050, and that increase is expected to be particularly in low and middle income countries, so that the number of, so that the percentage of people in low and middle income countries who of worldwide dementia is expected to be between 66 and 70%. So the vast majority of people with dementia will be living in low and middle income countries. So despite the number, the increase in the number of people with dementia, there's been a 25% incidence decrease in the past 20 years in the United States and Europe, including um, in Britain. And that decrease uh, has been related to 
uh, or is thought to be related to some changes in policy. Nonetheless, the, so there's, um, so while there's a decrease in the number per 100,000 in these countries, there are other countries where there is no decrease, which is uh, the number of people are stable and, and increased, and that's particularly in Southeast Asia, um, and also in Brazil and India. And that shows us that dementia is potentially um, preventable, but it's not inevitably preventable. Our actions make a difference. And the mechanisms of prevention of dementia are thought to be an increase in cognitive reserve, so the brain becomes more resilient and resists damage by plaques, tangles, or any other mechanism um, a bit, uh, and uh, before it develops dementia, and also by a reduction in damage, for example, uh, a reduction in smoking so it was, or in blood pressure, leading to reduced vascular damage. Um, and as you would expect, the improvements have been mainly um, at, uh, uh, therefore in people who are of higher income and more educated people within the high income countries. And that decrease within that group is something that we want to spread and to think about throughout the world. And equally, there's been a decrease in men, um, about 24% versus women have been about 8%. And that's another way that another inequality that it should be possible to change and to really make a difference. So this slide shows um, uh, how cognitive reserve works. If you look down at the bottom left-hand uh, graph, the on average, the more uh, 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 damage to cognition, people have the more uh, plaques, tangles, and other neuropathological lesions they have. So the people in the right-hand column who have late dementia have much more um, have a, a much more damage than the people in the left-hand column. But what that hides is um, the diff individual difference. So each of the four graphs above, every line is an individual who's been um, considered post-mortem. And if you look at the graph in the top, left or people with high cognitive performance, you can see that uh, people who have high cognitive performance on the right hand side of the graph have really quite a lot of, um, of Alzheimer's disease, microvascular changes and Lewy body changes. And uh, some of those in the top right hand side uh, could possibly um, have as much neuropathology as some people who have higher cognitive who have lower cognitive performance. Equally, some people with late dementia, the people, the, that's a fourth graph, the people with um, pure uh, plaques and tangles um, have, a, um, could easily uh, fit into the top graph, but nonetheless, that they have a late dementia. So what, um, uh, one of the things, so it's, not just the neuropathology, it's the resilience and resistance to neuropathology. And um, that has, uh, that's thought to be due to a concept called cognitive reserve. And that's the ability to tolerate brain changes without developing dementia. Um, and it's considered to be neurobiological. It's so hard matter, neurons and synapses. It's related to brain maintenance, lifestyle and genes, um, causing, um, allowing the brain to continue um, to have this reserve and also adaptability, enabling preservation despite neuropathology. And cognitive reserve is therefore not static and can be changed throughout life. So in our 2017 um, Lancet Commission, we presented a life course analysis of dementia. Um, I think it's never too early and it's probably never too late to try and prevent dementia. We define midlife as being age 45 to 65 and late life as being over 65. Um, and we looked at nine risk factors, which we took to the National Institute of Health and NICE recommendations, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK. Um, to try and consider um, what difference it could make if they were all, uh, if they could all be addressed. And 
uh, it was the first analysis, complex analysis, to include social isolation and hearing. Um, I just want to think that today, and um, this is the day that the FDA, when I'm recording this, not when you're listening, when the FDA has um, approved the first disease modifying drug for dementia, but however much we may modify um, disease, any future uh, disease, this will not remove the need for prevention. It's much better for people not to be developing pathology than to be having to take drugs for many years to try and prevent it progressing. So we had these nine individual risk factors from NICE and National Institute of Health and our commission re-met and discussed what other um, risk factors that we should add. And our um, idea was that we would only include those that had, uh, had persuasive, consistent evidence that they really did make a difference. Um, so the ones that we added, and I'll talk more about them in a minute, were traumatic brain injury, pollution and alcohol. We did not add, that doesn't mean they're not important, but we didn't add them because we didn't think they had persuasive, consistent um, evidence, uh, sleep and diet. So sleep, we found that the literature suggested that sleep either increased or decreased was related to an increased risk of dementia, and that most of the studies uh, were um, in the few years before people developed dementia and could easily be that the dementia that people were developing or um, already had but had not been diagnosed uh, was causing a change in sleep rather than the sleep causing a change in dementia. And when we looked at diet, we found that the evidence was inconsistent with no particular element. And we felt that we were not yet at the stage where we could add this risk factor. So these are our 12 risk factors in early life is less education um, and in midlife peripheral hearing loss, hypertension, obesity, traumatic brain injury, excessive um, alcohol in late life, smoking, depression, physical inactivity, air pollution, social isolation and diabetes. And we put these in particular places because uh, the evidence um, around them clustered at that particular place, but it doesn't mean that they're not important at other times, <coughs> apart from hypertension and obesity. So interestingly, um, as people are developing dementia, their blood pressure drops and they lose weight. <coughs> so people in late life who have either hypertension or obesity, are likely not to be at the stage of developing dementia and therefore the in late life uh, being thin and of low blood pressure may either mean that you're very fit or that you're in you're actually developing dementia. We then calculated the, uh, the population attributable fraction for each of these risk factors and that is a fraction theoretically preventable by eliminating the risk factor and the uncorrected path is calculated by considering the relative risk. And for these, we took worldwide meta-analyses um, times the prevalence of the risk factor we used for this all cause rather than Alzheimer's disease, dementia. We used international data as much as we could. Um, and again, I want to say that we calculated these 12 risks, but we know that there are others and that the, every day and certainly every week, the evidence is getting better. Then we calculated um, communality. And what I want to explain to you is that um, when you are doing experiments on lab rats, you can put one risk factor in and see what difference it makes. But people are much more complex than that. And um, uh, risk factors tend to cluster together. So the person who takes less exercise is more likely to be obese, is more likely to be hypertensive, and is more likely to have diabetes. And uh, what we did is we considered um, what risk factors um, clustered together and we weighted and reduced the effect for, um, for the communality. And if you don't do that, if you just take a risk factor and don't consider the effect that, um, that the person, that every individual with that risk factor might have 
other risk factors, you tend to grossly overestimate the risk. And we put this together in a, um, a and, and we drew a picture of it, and we, I hope you've seen this before, because uh, uh, it is something that uh, many, many people have looked at to try and explain, um, put in visual, um, in visual form, that these 12 risk factors together make up a potential 40% um, of the risk of dementia, if they were all uh, if they were all eliminated completely, I understand that they won't all be eliminated completely, but it could make a great deal of difference. And um, the other thing I'd like you to notice is that the biggest one is hearing loss. We were very surprised about that. I'll tell you a bit more about it in a minute. That's followed by less education, which is a very important worldwide risk factor, but is less so in some countries and that was followed by smoking and if you add these risk factors together they account for half of the 40 percent 20 percent so eight plus seven plus five um, so three risk factors uh, which really make a difference um, make the biggest difference but others while the numbers the percentage may be quite small they and when we consider of, of the numbers of people with dementia that the, the amount of risk uh, the, the difference they make to many people, they're really very important indeed. I wanted to show you this, it's in the Lancet paper, and what I wanted to show you is the difference it makes between weighting the path for the population attributable fraction for communality and not weighting it for communality. So education, uh, there was huge weighting for communality, um, and that meant there was a decrease in the risk from less education from 19.4 to 7.1, because, of course, people with less years of education are much uh, are likely to have much more difficult living conditions and are less able to make healthy choices. Um, equally, um, the hearing loss uh, was highly weighted and reduced from 22%. <laughs> <coughs> Eight percent and smoking from fourteen to five. <coughs> so when we first published this in two thousand and seventeen, there was a large uh, pushback about hearing loss. We did our own meta analysis in it, including only papers in which um, hearing was measured objectively using peripheral, uh, pure tone audiometry, including only papers that um, hearing was measured at least five years before the dementia, um, and including only papers where the incident dementia was adjusted for both age and cardiovascular risk. Um, and in fact, the uh, when we did that, the number of papers was quite small, it was only three, but, um, and you can see from the meta-analysis here how similar the risk appeared to be in all of them, and each of them from more than 10 years before the dementia. And what we found is that hearing loss, which is extremely common uh, as people get older, uh, had almost doubled the risk of people developing dementia, and that accounts for its big population attributable fraction because it's both high risk and common. And there's a big pushback about it with a lot of people saying perhaps uh, hearing was just a, uh, just a risk of cardiovascular uh, problem, just a measure, which is why we um, correct, made sure it was corrected for vascular risk factors. And perhaps it was just an indication, peripheral hearing was just an indication of early dementia. And since then, several other groups have looked at um, at uh, cohort studies and uh, found uh, that using hearing aids protects both from, from this increased risk of dementia, protects both from increased risk of dementia and from an increased risk of cognitive loss, suggesting that you can separate the loss of cognition due to hearing, which may be related to a lack of cognitive stimulation, um, to uh, social isolation and to depression um, from, the, uh, the, uh, from the actual hearing loss itself, and that wearing hearing aids may be 
um, a huge protection from dementia, the biggest protection we have. However, the caveat is that people who use hearing aids are likely to be people who are more privileged, who look after their health uh, better. Um, and uh, this may be an indication of that, but um, what it does suggest is that hearing is not just early cognitive decline, because if so, we would expect hearing aids to protect at all. Hearing loss is also associated with a temporal uh, low volume loss um, and the mechanism that may be uh, the causing dementia may be atrophy. Moving on to the second most important risk factor, education. Education is important for a cognitive reserve and a recent study that came out over the last week found that um, people uh, socioeconomically deprived children who, were, um, who had five years of a cognitively enriched environment had um, a higher uh, brain volume uh, in midlife at 45 to 50 and that education important, is probably important for cognitive reserve and reduces um, and changes the brain makes it and makes it less vulnerable we know that lifelong higher education attainment is related to decreased dementia risk uh, there's also evidence that education till age 20 is additionally protective. Um, after age 20, it becomes very unclear what it is that's um, making a difference, because while people who have more education after age 20 also do better cognitively, they tend to uh, pick more cognitively stimulating jobs that have, and have more cognitively stimulating occupations. And we know that uh, people in increased cognitively demanding jobs should decrease cognitive deterioration. There's also evidence that retirement may increase deterioration even if we allow for ill health. So countries which have a, a later retirement age have less cognitive deterioration than those who have a lower retirement age. Moving on quickly from hearing and uh, education. The third most important one was is smoking. Smoking leads to cardiovascular pathology and um, cigarette smoke also contains neurotoxin. Its high prevalence uh, contributes to, its, to a high population attributable fraction. It has more effect in later life because of the high mortality means that many smokers do not survive to develop dementia. Um, interventions are being used very successfully in many countries to reduce cigarette smoking. It's declining in most countries. Um, however, um, uh, to contradict myself, the recent Lancet report um, said uh, in last month in the Lancet about cigarette smoking said that 111 out of 204 countries had increased smoking since 2005, and that included China. Um, they didn't separate Hong Kong from China, um, and uh, I don't think I think um, that was it was included rather than just not mentioned. Um, and not only is smoking um, actively a risk, but passive smoking is also a risk. Moving on to think um, about social contact, um, one of the things about doctors is that people tend to say don't smoke too much, um, don't eat too much, do all these things which are not particularly enjoyable. But I think with this, what we're seeing is social contact is good for you. Um, and the socialising, which is generally, um, generally uh, enjoyable, is something that can help your health. Um, the population of attributable fraction of social contact is similar to hypertension and similar to inactivity, which are more traditionally considered risk factors. Um, and there's probably different reasons for that. Um, I think that social contact increases cognitive stimulation and cognitive reserve, but it also increases beneficial behaviours. People who live with someone else tend to eat better, they tend to drink less, um, and, uh, and they tend to exercise more. Uh, since the 2017 um, commission, 
my colleague, uh, Andrew Summerlad, with a group of us, looked at dementia studies and found that um, the dementia risk of people who were lifelong single is 40% more than those who are married and with widow and widowers in, in between having a 20% increased risk. And we thought that this was not at all related to wearing a wedding ring or a, a nice dress, but entirely related to uh, people having a, a longer social contact. Um, and the most reliable way to social contact is to uh, live with somebody. A 28 year follow up of over 10,000 people from the Whitehall study um, in Britain, also led by Andrew Summerlad, found that increased social contact um, in, at age 60 decreased um, dementia risk, as did uh, increased social contact at 50 and at 40. Um, other studies from China and around the world have uh, similarly found that high social contacts associated with better life cognitive uh, function and with good um, and good social engagement have decreased, uh, have less dementia. Um, and all of these show that many years before, so it's not just when people are developing dementia that they have less social contact, it's many years before they develop dementia, but it seems to make a difference. So moving on from there to the um, one of the new risk factors, we, we everybody's always known that drinking huge amount, um, massive amounts, um, is um, bad for your brain and likely to cause cognitive impairment. But uh, what seems to be the case is that even what might be regarded as moderate drinking, um, and it depends on uh, different cultures as to whether it is, uh, is that 14, uh, 14 American drinks uh, have make people a week, make people more likely to develop dementia versus less than 14. So between one and 14 units, um, uh, for, uh, uh, between one and 14 UK units, or um, uh, it seems to people have less dementia than people who drink more than 21 units. And that's the amount that can be drunk if people drink every evening, just a couple of large glasses of wine uh, with their dinner, they, very, they get way over 21 units. Moving on to traumatic brain injury, equally, um, people have always known that traumatic brain injury can lead to permanent cognitive impairment. But what um, happens is what we've been finding out recently is that any traumatic brain injury uh, leads to people um, being more likely to develop dementia up to 30 years later. And that's with in uh, road in road traffic accidents and military incidents in the states where um, people who had a traumatic brain injury in their 20s and 30s are developing dementia in their 40s and 50s. Um, in sports, and you may have heard a lot in the news recently about rugby and football um, and firearms and falls. So um, that risk is increased up to 30 years and um, and that and it's increased is it's a high increase um, about an 80 percent risk and as you'd expect it increases with severity and number of traumatic uh, brain injuries and this is again a new meta-analysis that we did for the Lancet Commission um, these while there seems to be a lot of footballers and rugby players who are developing dementia it's not uh, very clear uh, about the um, whether football and rugby um, in childhood um, does make you more likely to develop dementia. But um, many countries are now preventing children from um, uh, having uh, lots of heading falls. Our third new risk factor is air pollution. <coughs> uh, 
Um, we looked at 13 longitudinal studies with up to 15 years follow up of air pollution. And we found that the thing that seems to make a difference is the uh, PM 2.5 in the air. It doesn't really matter whether it's nitrous dioxide or carbon um, based, they all increase the dementia risk. We were unable to do um, a meta-analysis for this um, because if you look at all of the studies, they measured quite different air pollutions and they're quite different outcomes. Um, but using data from Canada, uh, with one study of all-cause air pollution with the outcome of all-cause dementia, two million people, uh, we found that if you looked at those in the third highest quartiles of pollution compared to those in the fourth, there was about a 10% increase of dementia. And um, there's now evidence from the Chinese Longitudinal uh, Survey that the Clean Air Act implementation in some areas have mitigated the risk of cognitive decline and that those areas with cleaner air have a, a, a less cognitive decline in um, over a period of only a few years. Lastly, I just want to mention hypertension because really it's um, uh, just because there is evidence that midlife hyper, treating midlife hypertension and keeping with the sprint mind uh, study, um, keeping systolic blood pressure under 120 compared to 140 um, reduces the chances of mild cognitive impairment or dementia and that hypertension um, and that treating hypertension in midlife, which um, may make a massive difference in the number of people with dementia. So I told you that we considered um, the risk in a worldwide uh, way, but using worldwide data is still massively biased. Um, they have mainly cohort studies are mainly in high income countries and are mainly in white participants. And we know that the risk factors vary between and within countries. They cluster around inequalities um, and um, they are higher in low and middle income countries. So with my colleague, Nahid Kadam, uh, we did a, a study uh, looking at the risk in um, three low, in, low middle income uh, country areas. Um, we amalgamated lots of the South American countries together because the results were very similar. Um, and we considered India and China um, and we used the 1066 data. So we know the number of people with dementia in low and middle income countries are rising faster than higher income countries. That's partly because of life expectancy increase, but also greater risk factor burden. Um, and uh, what we found is, as we expected, the potential for prevention in low and middle income countries is higher. Um, and uh, because it's probably mainly because diabetes and cigarette smoking are more common, but also in some of the countries because people have fewer years of education. Um, and um, so here are our findings that um, this is from the first commission where we used only nine risk factors and it's between the first and second one. We found with these nine risk factors that Latin America had 56% potentially modifiable dementias compared to 33 in uh, the world as a whole, that India had um, 41 compared to 33 in the world as a whole, and China had 40. So I think it indicates that while our worldwide figures are very important, that um, it's also important to think about individual countries and within that to consider individual populations and to target the risks that people have. Um, so we now have looked at New Zealand, which is a multi-ethnic country using a New Zealand um, survey, and um, we have an in-press paper uh, where we've um, in um, and we've shown again huge differences across uh, four ethnic groups in New Zealand, um, and. Um, 
possibly as you might expect. Um, there are um, Asian in uh, New Zealand, which is mainly, but not entirely, Southeast and East Asian people um, have the lowest risk, which is similar to worldwide risk. Um, white European descendants also have a, have a similar risk. Um, there's an increased risk in the in Pacific people over about 51%, and in Maori, the increased risk from these uh, risk factors are 61%, these 12 risk factors. So when we think about what to do, um, then we can think that prevention is not just about individual intervention, but consideration within societies and within different cultures and people within a society. Um, that culture, poverty and inequality are obstacles to or drivers of change and of the need for change. People who are most deprived, and we see this in, 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 in uh, low and middle income countries, but also in um, ethnic groups within countries um, and in women as, a, uh, um, as opposed to men, uh, need the change most and these and they will derive the highest benefit um, as societies we need to think from a, a beyond just thinking about individual health and begin to improve the circumstances in which people live and I will go into that in more detail in a second I just want to remember I just want to mention multi-domain countries fingers which is now worldwide fingers but we haven't seen results everywhere found a small reduction in cognitive decline after two years of individual intervention of people randomized um, to the intervention group. Um, and that was um, in, uh, versus control group. Um, the healthy aging through internet counseling in the elderly tried a similar study, but this time online instead of the intensive face-to-face was over 18 months and they were looking at cardiovascular uh, risks um, and um, for dementia rather than dementia in itself. Um, and uh, they found that there was a larger effect in younger age groups and those with less education, those people who were at higher risk because they had uh, cardiovascular problems at a younger age and those people with less education. And again, showing that targeting high risk the populations might be more effective. Nonetheless, dementia develops over a long time, over a lifetime, and trials are short. Um, they have to have a relatively small number of people, and, and the results tend to be a bit disappointing. However, what's happening in whole populations is inspiring and life-changing, um, and much, much more hopeful. And we can think about that's what... Um, that's the way that uh, life has been. The results, the changing in lung cancer by reduction in cigarette smoking is not something that's been done through randomized controlled trials. Um, in the middle, uh, you can see that John Snow in the UK, um, he um, found that lots of dots around the Broad Street pump of, a, uh, of people with cholera and um, he then found some, a family who didn't live anywhere near Broad Street, went to see them and asked them um, and uh, whether they had any connections because they had two had cholera. Um, he found that they did and that they went to Broad Street to get their water because they used to live there and they liked the taste. Um, and he went back, he didn't know about the bacteria, they couldn't see them at the time, but he went back um, and broke off the handle. Public health, um, uh, public health interventions by brave uh, people um, have made a huge difference over time and uh, the uh, individual changes have also made a difference but rather less so. So overall what does it mean? Any future disease modifying treatment will not remove the need for prevention. We wouldn't suggest that we can't, that we don't need clean water and we can just use antibiotics for cholera, that 40% of um, that 40% of dementia is potentially preventable, um, that the highest uh, bangs for your buck, as it were, are hearing, then education, then smoking. 60% uh, 
um, are unspecified. We needed assumptions to find a precise answer. Nonetheless, we uh, give some indication of the scale of the problem and what can be done. But risk factors, we also need to think that risk factors cluster around inequality. It's not just what the individual can do. Um, it's what the, can be done in the population. Um, and uh, vulnerable populations tend to have more risk. So my message is be ambitious about prevention, that everybody here can begin to do this. Uh, aim for systolic blood pressure, less than 130 millimetres of mercury from around the age of 40. Encourage people to use hearing aids for hearing loss, make them available, decrease hearing loss with a loud society. Reduce exposure to air pollution and secondhand air smoke. That means policy intervention, prevent head injury, needs policy intervention with seat belts, thinking about the um, how quickly traffic uh, goes, thinking about cars and how safe they are, um, the uh, thinking about uh, sport, limit alcohol drinks um, to less than 14 Australian units, or less than 14 US uh, units and 21 UK units weekly, Avoid smoking uptake, support smoking cessation, make it more difficult for people to smoke by having laws about smoking inside and in public places. Give all children uh, primary and secondary education, make society easy to move in, have pavements, make it easier to use public transport than cars, um, make, the, uh, make it safe. Uh, for people to be outside and then you will reduce obesity in the link condition of diabetes and keep in mind that the most vulnerable people stand to gain most but <coughs> it's not just individuals who gain but their family and society um, as we um, if it doesn't need to support as many people with dementia. Uh, then Britain um, there's now a uh, dementia risk reduction messaging communicated to all individuals having an NHS health check as a mandated part of the programme. So uh, people are told about some of their risk for dementia and it's kept in mind that uh, people, the, thing, the disease that people most want not to get is dementia and they're explained what difference it can make to them having um, controlling them. So thank you for your attention. Just leaving you with a photo of UCL um, and uh, we'll be talking soon. Bye for now. Thank, thank you um, for Professor Livingstone um, for wonderful uh, uh, talk about the, this different risk factors. And uh, now, yes, okay, the video is on now. And um, okay, um, I see Professor Livingstone is here. And so I think we can uh, ask some questions from the floor, from the um, audience. And for example, in the um, COVID times, each individual forced more social isolation. What is the impact of the pandemic on risk factor? Hi, thank you for inviting me here. Um, yeah, I think it's difficult to be absolutely sure, but uh, because of the fact that the pandemic has, it feels like it's been going on forever, but it hasn't, and we don't know long-term impact, but it is likely that um, the impact will be to increase people's risk of dementia um, as uh, they have, more social isolation, less cognitive stimulation, uh, and less exercise, and they're living in a much more restricted environment. Uh, but uh, we'll see that, that in the long term. The other uh, question is how much brain damage and neurological damage is done to people when they have COVID. And again, we don't know the answer to that, but we do know that quite a lot of older people present with delirium. Okay. So um, the 
second question is, what are the challenges of digital exclusion for risk factors? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that digital exclusion is also a marker for exclusion in other ways. So uh, older people with more money and more education um, are less likely to be digitally excluded and people who are um, who have had less education and not had access to digital devices um, have a sort of double whammy that they both have more of the risk factors um, and uh, in for example the pandemic it's harder for them to keep it's harder for them to talk to people uh, over the internet it's harder for them to uh, be able to look at and evaluate evidence about what might help them or to know what's happening um, and uh, to uh, for example and lots of people in the UK and I'm sure in other countries have been doing online exercise so all of these things people tend to be excluded from and um, and they act uh, synergistically with uh, being previous exclusion which has led to the state of people being digitally excluded. Thank you. So since you were talking about uh, exercise, so the third question actually is something linked to this. Does the impact of risk factor for dementia such as physical activity differ across the lifespan? Uh, the things that we know for sure the impact uh, differs across the lifespan are hypertension um, and obesity. And hypertension and obesity are, of course, affected by exercise. And therefore, people who exercise more are um, much less likely to be hypertensive um, and obese and also diabetic. Um, so at least working through pathways um, it's very important in midlife uh, to have exercise, whether it's more important by itself for dementia um, across different bits of the lifespan. I think we, we really don't know. Um, and it may be that, um, it, I, I, I don't know, it may be that uh, later on in life, nearer to the time when you're developing dementia, um, it is particularly important um, uh, to to exercise, but I don't think the evidence is at all clear. I see. Okay, the next question may be very obvious. Should seniors to be encouraged to start using hearing aids earlier in their middle age when levels of hearing loss are lower? I think, I mean, uh, I think this, this is to, so will you suggest or recommend using hearing aids in the early age, in the middle, even in the middle age. Yes, I think it's important to begin to think about hearing in midlife, uh, because there's clear evidence that people who wear hearing aids, who, have, who are hearing impaired and who wear hearing aids are protected from dementia. So um, I think that just as you might think that in midlife, it's important to think about people's blood pressure, you should think about people's hearing. Um, and, and we know that people are really quite bad at knowing whether they have hearing problems or not. Uh, they frequently think that um, any hearing problem, uh, that if they can't hear, it's the other person who's not talking clearly, and, and sometimes it is. Um, that, um, and uh, also people are very reluctant to have hearing aids. They see them as a symbol of old age uh, infirmity. Um, and very stigmatizing. And I think that that's something that, that as a society, as societies, we ought to be working against. And when I was a child wearing uh, glasses was uh, stigmatized, but now I see um, that um, people, you, you, Brendan and you are both wearing glasses and I'm sure you don't feel stigmatized by it. Um, round about half of the, population of young people, it seems to be at any one time, have uh, Bluetooth devices in their ears. And I think it's really important that we begin to think about having things in your ears, not as a sign of infirmity, as a, uh, but as a sign of 
being able to access different devices as, as fashion accessories, um, as ways of getting of knowing what's going on and that in itself would make a difference. So the next question actually is linked up to these questions as my, my personal questions. After you publish this paper as, um, so do you find any government or example UK governments uh, launch some screening for the hearing or, or encourage people to, to have some testing or, or, or examination? Um, I don't know if they have. What I do know is that after the 2017 um, commission, the UK um, launched, they have a, a midlife health check and as part of the midlife health check, they began to uh, say to people, your high blood pressure puts you at risk of dementia and it should be treated. And so talking about dementia for the first time ever. And they thought that that increased the number of people who uh, had treatment for it because people really don't want to get dementia. I'm now talking, a group of us are now talking with the um, UK Public Health um, about the idea of adding other parts of Dementia commission, uh, commission to the UK Midlife Check, including and particularly um, some sort of hearing screen. And I don't know whether, um, I don't know whether that will happen, but it's certainly something that we are talking about to policymakers and, and public health. Um, I, it's, we don't always know what happens in other places. So I don't know. I mean, I found out recently that South Korea's biggest priority in health is prevention of dementia, but I didn't know that before. Um, you know, there's things happen around the world, and it's one of the great things about talking to people around the world is they tell you what's happening in their countries. I think it's just important for the youngest because they now. I my, my observation is they used to um, they use the uh, the the year, year airport airports for example. So, um, and then uh, have a very loud um, music in the ear. <laughs> so, yeah, so prevention rather as well as cure is important for hearing uh, as well. But I mean, I, I, yeah, I, it, it's not just loud music. It's it's noise pollution in the streets, on the on the trains, on in various places. So I think hearing awareness is is going to be something that becomes more and more important um, in the future. Okay, so one more question from the audience is, uh, how important are stress and anxiety in the risk factor equation? Yeah, um, so I think I, I said in the talk, and I'm sorry about coughing all the way through it, I just had a cough, but I'm not coughing all the way through it now, that um, we, we, what we've been doing is looking at the risk factors in which there is really good consistent evidence. Um, and um, we, and depression was one of them, which is obviously related to uh, to stress. Um, we haven't. There's some evidence about anxiety, uh, but it's not um, huge amounts of consistent evidence about it. Um, and there's emerging evidence about post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health problems. And um, I mean, we our um, our 12 risk factors account for 40%. Uh, I'm expecting over the next few years to be able to have enough evidence to add a bit more about other risk factors. And certainly clinically, my, my observation is that uh, people who are very stressed um, or have been very stressed when they're younger, they seem to be disproportionately affected in our clinics. But um, again, you have to think about commonality and that people who, as I talked about at the end, that people with less resources often have more stress and often have other risk factors. So I think that's quite a long way of saying, I think it will be important and I can't put a number on it yet. Thank you. So any questions from the chair, Brendan, or? Thank you, I do. And I'm very much wanting to say thank you to Professor Livingston for coming in and doing such a great job. Um, I was very pleased to hear your thoughts about China. And I just wanted to sum up before we move on regarding the, the, the GBA as uh, Professor Chung is an expert in the area. 
And I wanted to just make a point about the work in China, which doesn't report hypertension very well. So one of the risk factors that may not be well diagnosed or underdiagnosed in the Greater Bay Area is hypertension. I think that's true in Hong Kong as well. But more critically, although hearing loss is now regarded as a, uh, a risk factor in studies of dementia in mainland China and recognized as a, as a critical predictor, the um, traumatic brain injury you mentioned, the, the, the insults to the head are, not, are also not recorded well. Uh, and that includes, in fact, in Hong Kong, surprisingly. So TBI is simply not recognized uh, as a neurological condition, um, at least insofar as public health records in mainland China. So I think that the, the lower um, percentage that you identified in China might somehow be due to a lag in the reporting of the risk factors that occur in the GBA. I wondered, perhaps Raymond, you could comment uh, on just verify my observations and then we'll ask Professor Livingston to remark. I, I totally agree with you, actually. Uh, I think this simply we lo lost um, and we underestimate the recording system in the past. And so that's why actually, I don't think we have lots of red, uh, red card on this. So um, how about in UK? Um, how, how do you start with all this red card? <laughs> and to... Yeah, I mean, um, the, uh, I, th I think things are done differently in, in different countries. So for some years now, um, primary care has been asked to record in midlife uh, blood pressure and they've done that in a, um, and, and the, it's one of the things that they get money attached and we've and the government's found that there's nothing like having amounts of money attached to an action to make primary care um, prioritize it. So they've, and they've generally worked by assuming that most people come to a primary care uh, doctor at some point and ensuring that they take their blood pressure when they do. Uh, so it's not been done as, and, and, and that is true. Most people do come at some point and um, have their blood pressure recorded and I think it's interesting to uh, to think about what effect that's going to have on the decades to come with more and more people having their blood pressure under control um, but uh, every every country has uh, a lack of records and I think we found TBI was the most difficult uh, thing to find in in really any country lots of people with TBI don't come to hospitals um, the don't tell people with primary care is a huge concern about sports injuries, but um, or or people just playing sport and having TBI, but they certainly don't record it, um, and it, it's a, a very un like many things, it's very under recorded, um, and the data we have it is is really really good compared to the data we used to have, but it's certainly not ideal and not complete. Uh, really, thank you, Professor Livingston. Um, um, so, in view of time, I think we are going to close this sections uh, to our talk um, uh, now. And then, because we are, we now see another authorities is coming <laughs> uh, um, for the next talk. Okay.